We want to welcome you to our online service. We are so thankful that you have taken time to join us for this evening's Bible study. Let us know in the chat box where you're watching from. Before we begin, we just wanted to remind you that you can connect with us online at www.champ.org. And you can also download our app in the App Store or Google Store. Of course, we would love for you to join us this Sunday on campus for a great worship service and encouraging message from our pastor. We also have some great activities planned for the kids. If this is your first time with us, we would love to connect. Just text FTG to 281-201-1719 to get connected. If you would like to join us in taking this message around the world, you can partner with us in giving. It's as easy as texting the word GIVE to 281-305-0505 or by going to our website, www.champ.org and clicking the Give Now. Again, thank you for joining us online. We pray this Bible study encourages and empowers you. Hello, I'm Andrea Smalley, head of school at Heritage Preparatory, located right here in Northwest Houston. Heritage Prep is a classical Christian school that believes in taking a stand for the children of our community and their education. It's our desire to provide a safe, Christ-centered learning environment where your children are free from the heavy weight of secularism. Heritage Prep prides ourselves on academic excellence with a proven rigorous curriculum. We offer a 12-acre facility, the option for hot lunches prepared by nationally recognized professional chefs, an on-site medical clinic, and Ninja Kids physical education from a real American Ninja Warrior, Coach James. We're committed to making Christian education accessible to all children in our community. As an exclusive offer for visiting us today, if you enroll your child, we will waive your registration fee. That's right, if you enroll today, we are waiving the registration fee, $150 in value, but you must enroll today. As we embark on this endeavor, please pray with us for the children of our community and their education. If you would like to learn more about Heritage Prep and how you can enroll your children, please click on the link and visit us at www.heritageprephtx.com or you can call our offices at 832-510-8767. Together, we can guard the hearts and minds of our children. I've got something in my hand that as good a friend and ministry partner as I have in the world, the incomparable Dr. Wendell Hutchins, the assistant general overseer of City Harvest Network, has a brand new book out. And you, believe me, you want to get your hands on it. It is a Holy Ghost guide to how to bring people back into victory, back into the house of God, back into strong disciples of Jesus Christ. Being that, it's called Kicking the Stars, Rediscovering Our Trust in God in the Midst of Crisis. Um, unbelievable wisdom in this book. And I had the privilege of doing the forewords right there. It's got my name on it right there. Dr. Rod Parsley had the privilege of doing the great, great forward in this tremendous book. Now, I want to encourage you to get a copy, and I know when you do and realize the breath of fresh air it is in these troubled times, Dr. Hutchins encourages all of us to get outside the tent of our constraints to look up, to expand our vision. This is a time to grow and explode and kick the stars. So I want you to get it. I know when you read it, you'll want to get copies for your leaders and so forth. So make sure you do that. If you turn your attention to Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, scripture reads, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me. O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 
But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Today I want to talk to you from this very inspiring subject, overcoming a victim mentality. Come on, I'm preaching to you this side. This is the side right here. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you come and visit us. We open our hearts and minds to receive whatever you have for us today. We cast out all the cares from this week, from this month, and we say, Lord, give us your manna, give us your word, shape our minds, shape our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. One more time, give God a hand clap of praise. We thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Um, Maybe five, six years ago, I was uh, at my house with my cousin, and two men broke into the house. And for 15 to 20 minutes, we became, came into a physical altercation. We were fighting. Come on, how many happy for a pastor that can fight? Let's go. Amen. <laughs> Just seeing where I'm at right now. Amen. <laughs> I was praying. How many happy for a pastor that can pray? Amen. <laughs> Woo. We were fighting. We, 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 were, we were going after it. For tw- it took 20 minutes for the police to get there. And when they got there, there's a difference between, like, when you're a kid and you're like, hey, meet me here. We're going to fight over here. Versus somebody coming into your house to fight you in an unexpected way. Your adrenaline's going crazy. You're, you don't know what's happening. It's pretty intense. And they get there, and they arrest the men, and they ask me this question, are you the victim? I said, no, do you see them? I'm the winner. (laughs) Give me my belt. (laughs) I'm not the victim. And they said, "That's, that's not the way this works. You're either the victim or you're the suspect. So are you the victim? And it took me a minute to kind of register and 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 swallow the reality that in this situation, I'm actually, whether I won or not, whether I survived or not, that I'm actually the victim. The victim, the suspect is the one who has to run when they arrive. But the victim gets to wait. The suspects are placed in prisons, but victims are placed in protection. Suspects are restrained, but victims are released. Suspects have lawyers, but victims, I don't know if you know this, they get assigned an advocate who speaks on their behalf. Are you the victim? I just want to tell you today, I know you want to be victorious. I know you want to know that you've overcome so much in life. But can we first acknowledge that you actually went through a lot in life? And that things actually happened to you. And that we all in some way or another have been victimized. And that's a vulnerable place to actually admit that maybe I was in a situation that I was powerless to. Maybe something happened to me that was out of my control. Maybe I had to bury somebody I didn't expect to bury. And all of a sudden, it's not a sin to be a victim. It's just something that happens in life. And we have to let God care for those wounds and heal us and walk us through it. And we have to say, Lord, I was powerless. I don't know why this happened to me, but I really need you to walk me through this. The problem is not that we've been victimized. The problem was when somebody knocked on my door and I got up like Kung Fu Panda and went to the door and checked on the cameras and I opened the door and she said, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? I said, you ain't gonna take my money, little girl. 
I know, there, I know there's like four or five others of you. You about to jump out and get me. <laughs> Give me those cookies and I just ran. <laughs> the problem wasn't being victimized. The problem was the stories that my mind would tell me and the trauma that I would experience would actually show up at every area of my life. And every time someone comes to the door, it became a threat rather than somebody I can actually invite in. And I developed a mentality, even though I won, that was a victim mentality. The Bible says in Romans 12, to do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That your trauma doesn't have to tell your stories, but the faith that you have in Jesus Christ gets to write the story. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, that we don't have to live the way we were treated or the experiences that we have. We don't have to replay, rehearse, but we get to renew our minds and we don't have to look like what we've been through. I want to give you five things that we learn about the victim mentality from the Canaanite woman. Number one, you can write these down. She didn't let her family's history determine her family's future. The Bible says that Jesus withdrew from this region, and it's the same region that Jezebel was born in. And she was a Canaanite woman. And I don't know if you've read a lot about the Canaanites, but Joshua wanted to eliminate them from the face of the earth. There was a history of these people that were enemies of the Jewish people. And she already knew that she wasn't liked where she was at. And she already knew that there would be resistance to who she was. In fact, was she expecting that this new and greater Joshua Yeshua would treat her any different than Joshua treated the Canaanites? But as she comes, she comes with this boldness that my family's history will not determine my family's future. And so many times we think we don't have this privilege or we, don't have, we weren't born in the right place and we weren't situated and everything was against us. And, and, and if we would only been born with doctors, then you would have just been spoiled in a trust fund baby. Don't worry about that. The Bible says, can any good thing come from Nazareth? From the ghetto? From the... The, the, the dumpster site, any good thing come from there? There's, this is the rule of the kingdom. You don't have to come from good places to have a good future. But in fact, you can come from low places, bad places with everything against you. And your his family history does not have to determine your family's future. You can come from a divorce home, a cracked out home. It doesn't matter where you came from. God's not taking notes to qualify you based off the legitimacy of your legacy. But God says, I'm going to take the people that were least likely to succeed. I'm going to take the people that nobody thought would make it. And I'm going to give them a future that wasn't by might, that wasn't by power. But it had to be the grace of God at work in their life. Where you're from has nothing to do where God's taking you. So you don't need to consult with your past. You don't need to consult with your family tree because God has a future that is greater than your past. Number two, she didn't let her opposition become greater than her mission. Matthew said, and behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. The disciples like, hey, as she's crying out to us, just give her what he, she wants so we can send her away. That's interesting that the disciples, she wasn't actually crying out to the disciples. But people who had nothing to do with the situation had a lot to say about the situation. You like that little attitude? That was 
They had comments to put on the situation. But I wasn't even talking to you. I was talking to Jesus. I didn't request your opinion on the situation. But because she had a need that was greater than who liked her or disliked her, she was focused on the mission of her daughter being saved. She wasn't focused on who was talking about her. She wasn't focused on who liked her or not. See, some of us, we forget what's important because we start taking votes around everybody else to let, so they can determine what's important for us. They're called people pleasers. Any of those in the house today? Well, I don't want to say anything because it might hurt their feelings. Well, if I do this, then that might happen. And you're always playing off of what somebody might be saying or thinking about you. Which is none of your business. When you have a mission that is focused, that is greater than conflict and opposition. You will walk through things that other people won't walk through because my mission is not to get your approval. My mission is to see my family saved. My mission is to see my daughter healed and delivered. And my daughter is ill and tormented right now, so you can say whatever you want about me. In fact, I have no response to it. I won't comment back. I won't come after you because you're not worth my time. In Jesus' name, amen. Her mission was greater than her performing to please people. You looking in the mirror of how you're dressing, not based off of what you see, but what, based off what you think other people will see. And you're not dressing up for you, you're dressing up for them. But when your mission is greater than your opposition, you don't live playing life in a defensive posture. They said something about you. I hope it was good. Amen. Keep. Because you have a mission. When your crisis becomes greater than your performance, your mission must be greater than your opposition. Number three, she didn't let her rejection dictate her direction. I know we heard that slogan before. Rejection determines your direction. <laughs> rejection? determines your direction how dumb is that amen that whoever and whatever rejects you is actually informing you on what's next in your life rather than the holy spirit telling you that even when they reject you i have a word and assignment for you the scripture read but he answered her not a word and his disciples came urging, saying, send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When rejection becomes our direction, we live a life of blaming everybody else and making excuses for where we are and what's going on in our lives. Look at The last time you got in an argument, whose fault was it? Yours. No, no, no. Not yours. Theirs. I was agreeing with you. Theirs. I, we were pointing at them. Theirs. Out of the 10 arguments you get in with your spouse, how many times are you wrong? Isn't it suspect that you're, you only have a tithe of being wrong? Like, you give them one to show how humble you are. <laughs> I can't be right all the time. I really messed up this time. But what about all the other nine times? The only reason I messed up now is because you've been messing up. And I'm tired of you messing up all alone, so I had to mess up to make this make sense. Blaming other people. Hey, you going to apply for the job? I don't know. They, 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 uh, they, they have so many candidates, and uh, th there's a family member that applied, so they wouldn't pick me. 
Are you going to go to that church? I, I don't know. There's a lot of nepotism there. You know, they probably wouldn't use me to my full gifting and capability. <laughs> they probably don't see the gift on me. So I need to keep going somewhere else because they, they, they who is they, they don't see me. Excuses and blaming other people is a sign that we are not surrendered to the will of God. John chapter 5, the pool of Bethesda, this guy, he's laying there as a paralytic, and Jesus is like, hey, you want to get well? He's like, every time I try to get well, somebody steps in front of me. It's their fault. You know where this started, right, with Adam? He's like, Jesus, or God, I'm sorry, um, but my wife, <laughs> she, she does what she does. I know, don't know how to work this out. We've been working on it. I had to cover it with the fig leaves, but really, you know me, Jesus. You know, you know me. You know how I do life. You know we're cool. We walk in the, in the cool of the day. But the woman you gave me, <laughs> such a problem. It's, she's so problematic. The, the guy at the pool of Bethesda, he says, every time... I want to do better and get well. Someone's always cutting me off. Someone al always gets in the way. Somebody always goes before me. And then he goes one further. He says, and nobody's willing to help me. That, ex that, that language. Nobody. You're always yelling at me. You're always this big... This blanket statement, you're always and forever and eternity from now and then and forever. Have you ever thought like your excuses, our excuses, and blaming others? It's like offensive to God. You're like, who's going to reject me today so I can be directed? And so you preemptively strike. You're like, I'm going to reject them before they reject me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be transparent because I'm going to put it out there to show how rejectable I am. To see if they'll reject me so I can stay far enough away that when they reject me, I just am far enough away. You know, it's a sin to blame and make excuses and base your whole life and identity, and future off of other people. The only one that, can, that you can change is you. <laughs> the only one is when you say, I'm going to take responsibility. The ability to respond to God's grace. I'm going to take responsibility and say, I'm going to quit making excuses. How many of you make excuses and blame people? Come on, just point at your neighbor right now. Just point at him. <laughs> Number four, she didn't let herself stop believing the best even when she heard and saw the worst. Then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. I love this. Because she's like, I need some help. He's like, I can't give the bread to the little dogs. If you study the word in Greek, it's actually like pet dog. There's two types of dogs. The wild dogs and the, and the pet dogs. And Jesus is like, hey, um, I'm not going to give the bread to the pet dogs. And she's like, Wow, I'm not a wild dog. I'm a pet dog. This is great news. Because a wild dog, he just has to go out and find trash. But a pet dog means he's at the master's table. And whatever falls from the master's table, I get to enjoy what the master's partaking of. This is so wonderful. I'm a pet dog. I'm not a wild dog. I'm a pet dog. I'm not a mixed dog. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real 
schnauzer. Like, I'm up, and they push me in strollers and buy me Christmas gifts and kiss me on the lips. Amen. You guys are disgusting. <laughs> I'm not a wild dog. I'm a pet dog. You see, how, you see how that works? If you change your perspective, then you'll receive the miracle as you perceive it. That's what uh, Elijah, uh, the Shunammite woman, she said, I perceive this is a man of God. And she received a miracle from Elijah. And then these young kids, they came, hey, Elijah, you old, fat, bald man. And then the bears came and ate the kids. One saw him as a man of God. One saw him as a fat, old, bald man. And they got their miracle according to their perception. When you get your utility bill this week, just say, look at the power of God rising in my life. Because as you see it, whoo, you'll start to receive things the way you, you'll start to receive people as you see them. If you see them as a danger, if you see them as a threat, if you see them as annoying, you're going to get all of that from them. But if you start calling your children, don't call them brat, don't call them uh, uh, evil, call them blessed man of God anointed daughter of God and you start seeing what God sees in them and you start prophesying out of them who they are in Christ Jesus you start seeing the best even in the worst situations how's we don't see things as they are we see things as we are and everything if it looks terrible I'd have to ask what's going in on in your heart that is giving us such perception. I'll close with this. Number five. She didn't let her reservation hinder her heart from believing and receiving. Matthew 12, 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Through all of this portrait of story that is happening, we get to the end of this story, and the secret of the right mentality is revealed. He said, oh, daughter, how great is your faith. Faith is the persuasion of God that allows our mind to be renewed. That allows old thoughts to be washed away. It takes when somebody calls you dog. Faith says, I'm not a dog, I'm a daughter. When people say it's impossible, faith, faith says, with God, all things are possible. Faith is the factor that gives us endurance and perseverance. Faith is the factor that allows us to live a life of overcoming. We can't do that. We can't do this. We can't afford that. Don't tell me what we can't afford or can't afford. God will instruct me in what we can't afford. Because you're seeing through the eyes of logic, but I, I'm seeing through the eyes of faith. I don't want to just tithe where I'm at. I want to tithe off of what I believe for the future. I want to tithe a million dollars. Amen. Because that means I have to make 10 million of them. Some of you, you're like, you, you don't have faith in a tithe. You, you, you have a tithe. It's like you try to tithe. Amen. But when you say, I'm going to have faith that is beyond where I'm currently located. Crazy faith. Impossible faith. This is, this is when Jesus comes and he dies on the cross. He's placed upon the cross. He dies at Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And it's believed that Adam was buried there where his skull would rest. Can you get this graphic image with me of the cross coming and piercing the skull of Adam and the blood of Jesus running 
into the mind of mankind. The Bible says in Hebrews, it says that every dead work of our mind be renewed by the blood of Jesus. And as Adam's mind was being renewed, in the second Adam, Jesus, his skull being filled with the blood of Christ, this is good news for you today. That the blood of Jesus washes over all anxiety that has plagued you this week and this month. That the blood of Jesus has renewed every thought and every mindset and every uh, victimization and victim mentality. That God has the power to restore and renew your mind. Let's stand. You don't have to. Replay it, repeat it, or rehearse it. It's a renewing, a thought, an old memory to give away, a new one to be replaced, transformed into the future. This week, what have you meditated on? Have you meditated on your problems? Have you prophesied through complaining? Or have you meditated on his goodness? Have you received his grace? Have you read his word? Anybody reading the Bible every day? Just raise your hand right now. Just lie right now. Please just lie. <laughs> we'll repent. How can you live an overcoming life with a renewed mind if we don't meditate on his goodness and read his word and lift your hands and worship and pray? This lady, she was, she was insulted by Jesus. And you know what the Bible says? She fell down and she worshiped. When you get offended, what do you do? You walk away or you worship? Oh, no. He's not, he's not going to be here for another three months. Go, go. He's not going to be here for another three months. We said the wrong thing. Imagine Jesus like imagine Jesus here today. He's like, hey, quit being a dog. He'd be like, I'm going to another church. What do you do with your offense? She's like, look at this ain't really about me. There's a lot going on in the world. You know, the, the Bible actually teaches, says, in the last days, there's gonna be uh, there's gonna be earthquakes and Rumors of war. We're like, man, it's the end times. But there, there's, there's a small, small part of that scripture that said, and many will be offended. Right. You're all looking at earthquakes. I'm looking at everybody in the church, and they're all offended about everything. Yeah. Fathers turn against sons, sons against fathers. Offended. Yeah. How hard is it to offend you? Man, in, 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 in Scripture, it was, like, pretty intense. But here's, like, the air conditioner was way too cold today. The music, did you hear? Did you hear the music? It, it, there, was, there was a ringing. We can't go back there. <laughs> like, do you see what's happening in the whole world? And we become so petty with mentalities that are not godly. But today, we receive a renewed mind. Would you stretch your hands? Father, I pray over the minds of everyone that is here today. A mind to believe. A mind that is free from anxiety. A mind that is free from depression and worry of the past. Let your blood wash over their mind, over toxic and negative thoughts, over constant worry. Let this mind that is in Christ Jesus be in you today. For we are victorious in Christ Jesus. Your marriage is victorious in Christ Jesus. Your children are victorious in Christ Jesus. Your heart 
though it may be troubled, is victorious in Christ Jesus. You are victorious in Christ Jesus. And as you receive that renewing of the mind, let your mind be healed and filled by the presence of God. Would you begin to confess, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Would you love on him and let him love on you? Jesus, we thank you today. Holy is your name. Worthy is your name. Faithful are you, O God. Renew our mind. In the name of Jesus, we declare victory in this house. We declare and take every thought and evil imagination and bring it subject to the obedience of Christ. We say our mind shall be renewed in you. We shall live free. We shall live victorious. We shall be overcomers for he that overcomes, overcomes in the name of the Lord. We don't wrestle with our decisions. We surrender our decisions. We don't create arguments. We surrender our arguments. We don't create narratives. We surrender our story. We surrender the pen that you would write the text. That you would tell the story. That faith tells the story. Trauma doesn't tell the story. Fear doesn't tell the story. Sin does not tell the story. Faith tells the story, God. So write on our hearts today. And inscript upon our minds the thoughts from heaven. For your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are greater than our thoughts. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward. And if you need prayer today, you're like, man, I've just been struggling in my mind. We want to pray for you in these next couple minutes. Hey, thanks so much for being here with us today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at champ.org and on Facebook and Instagram at Church of Champions Houston. We believe God has something unique to say to you. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us. Have a great weekend.